Thank you for listening to Halloween Music's podcast series on the Baroque era. My name is Sarah Joy, and in today's episode, episode four, we will be talking about the Baroque instruments. Before we get started, I want to let you know that Halloween Music created a Spotify playlist that includes all of the pieces that we have playing throughout this podcast. And in the podcast itself, we only play cuts of the pieces, but if you want to listen to the full recordings, you can visit that Spotify playlist. All right, so brief recap. Um, the Baroque period was roughly between 1600 and 1750, and some notable composers that you may know from that time are Bach, Handel, Vivaldi, Monteverdi, Lully, Purcell, and lots of others. And some of the stylistic characteristics of that time, we had a lot more ornamentation, rhythmic freedom, expressivity, and the use of polyphony and homophony. And plenty of others, and we talked about that throughout episodes 2 and 3. All right, so let's get started by talking about one of the primary keyboard instruments of the era, the harpsichord. Much like most of the other Baroque instruments and how they are different from today's instruments, um, the progression was that they kept getting louder and brighter and clearer because they wanted to fill up big spaces, have the sound reach as many people as possible. And so throughout this time, the harpsichords kept getting bigger and brighter and able to produce more sound. So they were used as both a solo instrument and an accompanimental instrument for playing basso continuo. Now the biggest problem with these, and one of the main differences between a harpsichord and a modern day forte piano, is the ability to transition from dynamic to dynamic smoothly. The harpsichords had stops where when you would push them, it would change the sound in one way or another. So one stop, for example, could make the harpsichord sound more like a lute. Another would change the dynamic. But even though they did have the ability to adjust dynamics, it wasn't possible to do it smoothly. So that's something that uh, harpsichord makers, um, you know, that's something that they were trying to figure out, trying to figure out what to do. So that's what led to the forte piano, what we have today. The earliest forte pianos were developed in the Baroque period, but it took a while for them to actually gain prominence and take over the place that the harpsichord had previously occupied. And I believe that that happened technically past the Baroque era. I think it was 1760. I have a recording example that I want to share with you. This is Bach's Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 5 in D major, movement 1, and this will give you uh, the chance to hear what a harpsichord sounds like, because they did indeed use a harpsichord for this recording. <laughs> Another keyboard instrument that you may have heard of from this time was the clavichord. This was a much less versatile instrument because it was so soft, you couldn't really use it for performance. Or if you did, you were only performing for a few people in a small room, perhaps at your home. It was best just for individual playing, a way to practice, just to make music for yourself and a few family members and friends. And then of course you have the organ, which was hugely popular and hugely important during this time. And honestly, not much changed from the organs of the Baroque era from the organs of today, except that I suppose nowadays, you know, a lot of concerts and performances will use um, an electronic organ if they don't have an actual organ built into the venue, but not much has changed there. Let's talk about the violin family now, and this is a topic that I feel a little bit more comfortable talking about because I am a cello player and so I have um, a little bit more familiarity with these terms and concepts. 
And I think I'll start out by just giving you a brief look at a modern day cello and kind of talk about the different parts and pieces so that when I share with you how they were different from the Baroque era, you'll kind of have a visual idea. So this is a full size modern cello. Here we have, ooh, okay. Here we have the bridge. This is the fingerboard, these are the strings, your tailpiece, your fine tuners, F holes, here's your end pin, which whenever the cello is upright, that's what keeps it standing. Um, I don't know when the end pin came about, but they didn't always have them. Whenever stringed instruments were starting to be developed, you would just kind of hold the instrument between your legs, but the end pin uh, definitely makes that easier. You have the scroll up here, and then these are your pegs, and your peg box. These are, these are used for tuning if you want to greatly drastically change the pitch. If your instrument is really out of tune, you'll use these. And if it's just a little bit out of tune, you'll use the fine tuners right here. Oh, also, how... The cello is tuned, it's tuned in fifths. So the bottom note is C, up a fifth, this is G, up another fifth is D, and then the highest string right here, up another fifth is A. The strings that I use that are on this cello, they are, I believe, made of stainless steel for the top two and tungsten on the bottom two. But back in the day, and they still make these and people still use these types of strings, they made uh, gut strings, cat gut strings. I don't believe they ever used cat guts for those strings, I hope. Normally the gut strings were, and still are, made from sheep and goat and cow intestines. I believe that some other animals also have the privilege of being made into strings, um, but I don't have the complete list. But that's kind of um, a big difference in what made uh, Baroque instruments sound a certain way versus modern instruments sounding a certain way. Again, some people still use gut strings on their instruments today. Personally, I don't quite like them as much as the modern strings, but that's, that's an entirely personal preference. Um, and yeah, it just depends on what you like. Just a general difference between Baroque instruments then and the instruments we have now is that the sound was just so much um, softer and sweeter and rounder back then as opposed to today. And some of the structural qualities that created that sound back then, um, stringed instruments had lower bridges and the angle of the neck was different. The fingerboards were shorter and the neck was shorter and thicker. And again, uh, the gut strings really make a huge difference. Another big difference uh, is the bow. And so here is a modern bow. And I actually, I went a whole semester in university playing with a Baroque bow for one of my classes. It was really difficult to get used to. I don't know, maybe other cellists don't have quite the same reaction that I did. Um, I, I don't know how I felt about it. It was, it was pretty strange. The Baroque bows, they didn't really have a standard form, but generally they were shorter and they had a rounded stick and it had a lot looser hair. Okay, so that's it for the brief overview of differences between uh, Baroque and modern string instruments. Now, this is the part that I'm gonna definitely have to look at my notes for. I do play multiple instruments. None of them are wind instruments, so I'm just not very familiar with wind instruments, but I did do my research. Okay, so let's talk first about the flute. Whenever you see flauto, spelled F-L-A-U-T-O, indicated in a Baroque score, that meant that the composer wanted you to play that part with a recorder. However, if you saw flauto traverso, which is spelled T-R-A-V-E-R-S-O, that indicated that you were to play the part with a, tra with a transverse flute. A transverse flute is the type of flute that we have today in orchestras. When you think of a flute, that's a transverse flute. 
and I'm going to play you a recording example of a piece featuring the transverse flute. And we actually listened to this, I believe, in the last episode. This is box suite number two in B minor, the third movement. I have seven of these that I'm going to talk about. So that was number one. Number two is the oboe. The oboe is a double reed instrument and it developed from the Renaissance sham, spelled S-H-A-W-M. And the main distinction that I read about really was that it developed a narrower bore. Number three is the bassoon. The bassoon is a double reed instrument and that developed from the Renaissance kirtle. And it was actually used as a basso continuo instrument, which I believe I talked about in episode two. Number four is the clarinet. My grandmother actually played the clarinet. She went to Eastman School of Music for clarinet. It is a single reed instrument. And this is the one I hope I pronounced correctly. It developed, <laughs> developed from the chalumeau, spelled C-H-A-L-U-M-E-A-U. Number five is the trumpet, and this developed from the cornetto. Now what's interesting is that it had no valves and uh, it could only play harmonic overtones. But what's so interesting is that because of that, you know how in the harmonic overtone series, the notes get closer and closer to each other the higher you go. Um, basically that means that they were able to play melodic lines, but only if they were at the highest highest range of what the instrument was capable of so they were actually able to play little melodies using the close together harmonic overtones but it was super super high number six the trombone developed from the sackbut spelled s-a-c-k-b-u-t and it was used in kind of specialized contexts. it was used in the church and then also in theater and opera to depict um spooky scenes for lack of a better term. The last instrument to include in this podcast, not wind instrument, would be a timpani, which was played alongside the trumpets. And again, this was used for royalty, military, religious, big, dramatic god moments. Um, so yes, very, again, regal and dramatic. All right, I think that about does it. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. I hope that you're enjoying the series. And yeah, stay tuned for episode number five.